Hi, in this video I'll be talking about TERP surgery or transurethral resection of the prostate. If you're watching this video, I assume that you've already decided to have a TERP and you're just not sure about what happens when you go to hospital, what happens during the operation and when you're in the recovery ward and also what happens when you go home. Now, I had this surgery six days ago and I'll just cut to the chase now. I'm doing fantastic. I'm absolutely amazed with the results. Now everyone is going to be different because we react in different ways. But so far, I'm absolutely amazed and I feel like it's life changing. So I have a renewed appreciation for the work that the doctors and nurses and the anaesthetists perform for for society so i really can't state highly enough how much i appreciate the work that they do so before we go into those details about the hospital and the surgery itself let's talk about what led you to this point in my case it was a enlarged prostate so i have bph and i've been dealing with it for the last five years and it started when I was about 55 and it progressively got worse. So if I drank alcohol, I would have trouble. I'd go to the toilet multiple times. And then as the years went by, I was finding that the flow was reduced and I was getting up more at nighttime. So maybe instead of getting up once in, in the night, you might get up three times and that would progressively get worse. And then I found that I was, if I was stressed or I had a health issue, like I was constipated or I had diarrhea, I went into retention, meaning that I couldn't pee. And you would back up and you would have to go to an emergency and get a catheter for relief. So that happened four times, mostly when I was on business trips. So you can imagine what that was like being in a foreign country and having to go to an emergency and you got a flight back home the next day so uh, things were getting serious i try to manage it usually before surgery is ever discussed you'll see the urologist and you'll be put on to alpha blockers so that you can manage the symptoms for a few years but at some point you're going to need surgery so in my case, I was self-catheterizing because I was going into retention more and more often. And then eventually I had permanent catheters because I was just having so many issues. And that's not a good place to be, given that with catheters comes issues with uh, UTIs, infections, and the pain that comes with that. So... I decided to have the TERP. I had apprehensions about possible side effects of the surgery, like any man would. Um, I was concerned about retrograde ejaculation. I was concerned about possible nerve damage and, and what that could mean. Um, I did overanalyze it, but I needed to do something. So I, I spoke to other men about their experiences and most of them said that the TERP procedure worked very well for them and their life had improved. I, I did speak to one man who had a TERP procedure very young and had to have a second procedure and he had issues after that. But in the end, I decided to have the TERP and I trust my surgeon that he's, he's going to do the best for me to give me the best outcome. So how I ended up in hospital waiting for a TERP procedure. So let's have a look what happens um, as you're preparing to go into hospital. So what they'll do about a week before the operation, you'll have a pre-assessment and there'll be lots of questions like, are you a diabetic? Do you have any allergies? Do you have any conditions that they need to know about? So there'll be endless questions and you get through those questions and I was a bit surprised that the nurse asked me for my to measure my leg 
and I found out that was so that they could order compression socks that would fit my, um, my lower leg because they're very worried about DVT or blood clots because during the operation you're going to be still for a long period of time. I was also given a um, antiseptic wash and told that on the day of the surgery I needed to wash myself from head to toe under armpits, in the groin, everything, everywhere with this wash just to make sure that my whole body was clean. Uh, so my surgery was for Thursday and of course on that morning I washed myself head to toe with that wash. Uh, of course you, you have to fast so no food from the night before which I did. Um, I have no problem with that because I do intermittent fasting all the time. They also mentioned that you need to be careful about how, how much water you drink on the day. So I, I just had a little bit of water in the morning, no coffee, nothing like that. So I made sure I stuck to the instructions. To prepare for the hospital, I took a few things with me. I took some natural laxatives because I've been taking antibiotics for the UTIs that I've been having with the catheters. So I, I knew that with antibiotics I would have trouble with constipation. So I took some natural laxatives with me because yes, they will give you antibiotics after the operation just to make sure that you don't get any infections. And so, yeah, you don't want to get constipated while you're in hospital. So I took those and I also took a eye mask so that I could try and get some sleep because there's lots of lights in a hospital and another item which I should have taken with me but I had to ask for when I was in the hospital was earplugs. You'll have other patients who have calls and their phone will be going off and they'll put it on loudspeaker and they'll turn on the TV and, and nurses will be coming in and out all night long. So yeah, the, the earplugs helped just so that you might get a few hours sleep and you need to organize a someone to drive you home from the hospital whether it's a taxi or uber or your wife in my case my wife came and picked me up i did take a power bank with me so i could charge my phone because you will be probably in the hospital for two nights and uh, you need something to do you know let your loved one know that you're coming out and to pick pick you up so a power bank is a good thing to take with you. All right, so that's the preparation that I did. And I arrived in the hospital and again, there was a whole series of questions multiple times to make sure that I, I am the patient that they, they expect and I am having a TERP procedure and I'm not having something else. So there's no mistakes. Eventually I was wheeled in on a, a wheelchair into a room with other patients who are waiting for their surgeries. So I had a chat with them. Everyone was having different surgeries. Uh, there was a, a guy with his mother because English was not her first language. So he was translating for her. So everyone's different circumstances and some of them looked quite concerned. Others were just zoning out. So eventually they came for me and confirmed again who I was, did I know I was having a TER procedure and a chap came in and wheeled me to the operating theatre and just before I arrived at the operating theatre, <laughs> lo and behold, my surgeon was walking the other way and he recognised me and even though we hadn't met in like a month and a half or two months, he still recognised me and came over and greeted me and uh, reassured me that everything would be would be fine and uh, I was so so happy to have that opportunity to see him just before my operation and the guy who was pushing my wheelchair said oh that's quite rare you, sh you normally don't see the surgeon at all so they wheeled me in uh, to the uh, operation theatre and I got on the table and then the first conversation you have is with the anaesthetist and she puts the needle in your in your hand and 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 then I think they put an IV on first so it, in my case it was quite cold so I could 
feel it going in and it seemed to be quite cold. And they started prepping me and told me that, well, you know, you're going under general anesthetic and you're probably going to fall asleep now. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm, I'm not asleep. I wonder if I could stay awake. And, but before I knew it, I was out. And the surgery again. And you can see some of these here where you've got a normal prostrate and you've got quite a large prostrate on, on the right hand side here. My prostrate was very large. The procedure took place. I assume that you understand what happens, but basically there's a wire with electricity going through it and that scoops out the areas of the prostrate to form a better uh, opening for the urine to flow through and it'll probably be wider at the top and then taper down so the surgeon's going to try and create the, the best possible flow for you in your prostrate so you're out so you don't know what's happening but um, eventually what's going to happen is the surgery finishes and you come out and you go into the post-operative ward and you, you'll be on a bed with other patients who have just finished their operations. So they're, they've been under anesthesia and they're trying to, and the nurses that are with them are trying to wake them up. So I, I woke up and there was a nurse next to me and the conversation was around, well, how much pain do you feel at the moment? Can, from zero to 10, when 10 is agony and zero is no pain at all so she was constantly asking me well what's your pain level at and her job was to make sure that she administered enough drugs so that i was comfortable she told me that, that i had a catheter uh, which i quickly forgot and i asked her do i have a catheter in and, and shortly after she told me i had a catheter and then the registrar turned up. That's the doctor who's shadowing the, the main doctor and learning the robes. And he conveyed to me what happened during the operation. And he basically said, everything went well. Um, you've got a very large prostrate. And the surgeon, my surgeon, found that he could, he decided to remove just half of the prostrate because it was so large that just removing half the prostrate would have already take a long time to do and he, he wouldn't have time to do both sides and he believed that half the prostrate would have been enough to resolve my issues. As you can see I'm, I'm very happy with the results as I've been stating. So he, he was talking to me but because I was quite out of it I I knew that I was. I had to focus on what he said so I could remember <laughs> what he had told me. Um, but I just remembered that everything went well and and they, the operation took a lot longer than normal. So during this time that the nurse was still asking me how my pain levels were going and I noticed that I was shivering a bit. I had a pain, it was hurting and it was aching but not off the scales, it, but it hurt. And so the medication she was giving me was helping and I started shivering. Uh, I don't know why I started shivering. She thought I was cold and asked me if I wanted a blanket. And I said, uh, it's not that I'm particularly cold. I, I was just shaking a bit. So she upped the, the pain medication a bit and I settled down and started relaxing. During this time, they, they gave me an oxygen mask and I was breathing in oxygen. And she said, uh, I need to be careful with the the amount of pain medication I give you because the more I give you the more irregular your breathing will be more the less you'll breathe so I started focusing on my breathing to try and make it as regular as possible eventually she seemed convinced that my breathing was regular enough to let me out of that ward so they switched over the breathing mask for a tube that went up my nose and they put a bottle at the end of the bed and I was then take wheeled out in the bed to my rec recovery ward where I'd be for the next 
two days or two nights. All right, um, what I didn't explain is that that catheter that I mentioned before, that was put in while you had the operation. And it's a three-way catheter. And it's three-way because one port is to fill the bubble that goes inside your bladder to anchor it in so it doesn't can't be pulled out. And then the middle port is, or drainage port, is so that you can drain the urine out. And the third port is so that they can do bladder irrigation, which I'll go into more detail shortly. So they wheel me out and you're sitting there and the night is coming and you've got tubes and and bags all around you and you've got things connected to you and you're sitting there. So I'll just show you the video I recorded of what it looks like when you come out and you're taken to your room. So you can hear a buzzing sound there. I'll explain what that is. That's there my compression socks. There's the th three three way catheter. There's my IV that's still connected to my hand. See the bags at the end of my bed and there's the drainage bag. And yeah, there's blood in that bag. And I'm connected up to a uh, blood pressure monitor and I've got a sensor on my fingers so they can keep track of my heart rate so yes you have pipes and tubes all over the place and yes and so the night begins here's another shot of my room and I'm ready to start the first night so those two big bags at the end of my bed they both contain two litres of saline and that's part of the bladder irrigation system which I'll explain about more in a moment. Then at the bottom of my bed I've got this uh, compression pump which is pumping air into, into these um, bags that are strapped to my legs and they're filling up with air and massaging my calves because uh, they've got to be very careful that you don't get blood clots in your leg. And of course, there's the uh, C-ray Foley catheter, and I've got the middle tube going to the drain, and then the one on the sides going up to those bags that are end my, at the end of my bed. Notice that one is higher than the other. And then of course, the uh, IV and the blood pressure monitoring equipment. So what's going to happen is that all through the night and into the next day, they're going to start a continuous bladder irrigation process. And this is really important because you've just had surgery and you're bleeding. There's bits and pieces that are coming off, clots are forming, and that's all in, happening inside your bladder. And those clots, can block up your catheter. So what they do is they hook up these bags and that's going down into through your catheter into your bladder and it's flushing it out. So it's going in and then out through the drainage tube all day and all night. The idea is that if you keep saline going into the bladder then when you bleed it's not going to have a chance to clot because it's been uh, diluted in the water and then it's going to come out in the bag and and prevent those clots from forming. Initially the, the bag's quite red and as time progresses on it should get lighter and lighter. Now I was really surprised at how many of these bags they put through me. So two litres and two litres, so they do two at once, so that's four litres in total, and there'll be four litres in this bag that it drains out to. And they open those valves right up, so they drain as quickly as possible in, in, at the start. And uh, all night long, the nurses were coming in and, and emptying the drainage bag into a bucket, and then putting another 
two bags on the uh, on to replace the ones that were depleted all night long. So I, I, I tried to count, but I, I think I had over 20 of these bags by the time it was morning, just flushing me out all the time. And uh, I, I looked at the, the bag and it was still quite red. And I was, I assumed that, well, given enough flushing, it was going to lighten up at some point. So I was quite surprised at the, the amount of work that the nurses had to do. So, yeah, you're probably not going to get much sleep on the first night. Um, I, I only got about an hour and a half of sleep. Let's talk about those blood clots. They're flushing out the, the bladder and it's going into the drainage bag. You do have clots inside your bladder and hopefully they'll come out uh, through the tube, but they can get stuck. And you can see here, uh, I've got a video of some of the clots that are coming out of my tube. They're quite, quite a large size, but you can imagine if they got stuck in your catheter, what would happen is that you've got these bags trying to flush out your bladder, but the exit point is blocked by, by clots. So the nurses are constantly monitoring, you know, is everything flowing through correctly and are you blocked with a, with a clot? Now, if you do get blocked with a clot, they'll do a manual irrigation. And what that means is they'll get a, a, a really large syringe. They'll, they'll get the drainage port. They'll disconnect the, the irrigation tube and block that off and then they'll get this huge uh, syringe fill it up with about 50 mil and they'll inject that into your drainage port and that'll go into your bladder and push out any clots that may be blocking the the pipe and then they'll get another one because they don't want to make sure that when they pull it back that they're not sucking on a dry bladder but they'll get a second one and then put it in again and then pull back it's almost like you're trying to unblock a sink with a with a plunger so they'll push it in they'll pull it back and push it in and pull it back trying to get any clots and suck them through the catheter to try and with, withdraw them from the from the whole system and if they get any clots out they'll they'll then empty that out and if they've cleared the problem they'll then reconnect you to the irrigation bladder saline tube and you're off again um, cycling through. So you can see here uh, I've got some shots of the sorts of lumps that come through and down here as well. So don't be surprised if you're if you see clots starting to come through. I'll talk a little bit more about the compression socks now. So you're lying in bed you really can't move because you've got all these tubes and you've got the catheter in you you can't get up and walk around so you're just sitting there for a day and a half not moving so the compression socks help with that but the compression pump which is uh, got velcro straps and it goes around the socks that's got airbags that are under your calves and every minute um, every 30 seconds it'll cycle from your left to your right leg and you'll hear the pump going boop 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 as the air goes in, it'll pump it up, compress your calf muscle, and then it'll press, compress a little bit more, and then relax, and then it'll do the next leg. I found that quite pleasant, and uh, I'm certainly happy that they put that on, because if you're sitting down and not moving for a long time, you can get stiff and crampy, but you can see the measures that they go to to prevent uh, blood clots from forming. So a very important part of the process. At the same time, on the first night, they hooked me up to a blood pressure monitor and that was set to automatically take my blood pressure every 30 minutes. And because I had anesthesia and I had surgery, yeah, my, my blood pressure was quite low when I, when I came out into the ward. So you can see there that the monitor shows I was basically sitting around 100 over 55. The nurses were monitoring that to, to see um, what could be done. So uh, 
I had an IV in me, but um, in the morning they told me that my blood pressure was quite low. So I said, well, would it help if I drank water? Uh, and they said, yes, you know, drink as much water as you can. And so I went with that. And over the next, it did go up and down, as you can see here, but eventually, eventually I, I, I got it in a good range. So you, you can see the last one there is 123 over 71. It does make a noise when your blood pressure drops. So hence the, the uh, earplugs are quite helpful because all night long it was going beep, 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 beep. Right, uh, so at the next day, about midday, they thought that my uh, bladder irrigation was progressing well and the colour was good enough to stop the irrigation. So they, they plugged up the irrigation port and they then put a, a leg bag on me. And that's, that means now that the middle port is draining to the leg bag. You can see it's still quite red, but the idea was that, well, it's cleared up enough now that I shouldn't have that many issues with blood clots. And after the leg bag, then I, I can go to a void trial. Once you get the leg bag on, that means you can get up out of bed and have a shower. So I took the valve curve off the uh, compression pump device so my legs were then free got out of bed and had a shower now when I went to the shower because I was now standing up what I found was that I, I had leakage around the the catheter at, at this point here and I was standing up and I saw blood coming out and then I saw clots big big clots lumps of blood dropped to the floor and I, I in the shower I was just washing that away so don't be surprised if you see clots come out not through the, the tube but around the catheter on from the, around the outside so I cleaned that off I felt better after the shower and I went back into bed and had something to eat and and just waited for the next stage now the the red strap doctor came and saw me and he inspected my day bag and he greeted me and said hi how are you going all the rest of it I, I do feel sorry for the nurses sometimes and the doctors because uh, I can see other patients when they they get to see them they sometimes want to tell the nurses or the doctors their life story and all the things that went wrong and what surgery they're having next and and they're quite busy people they're doing the best to help you and and i i just feel sorry for them sometimes when some a, a patient wants to tell them their life story so I, I i try to keep it brief when a doctor speaks to me i listen um, i try and think of the questions i want to ask and keep it as short as possible because they have a busy busy schedule so he, he did look at my bag he asked me about it and he said, well, okay, that's quite red. I said, it's, yes, it's been like that all day long. And he said, well, that would probably mean that we have to put you back on the irrigation cycle again, get that blood out of your system, clear up the bladder. And I said, I, I don't mind. I'd rather have my bladder, um, as much blood and clots removed as possible because after my experiences with catheters, I knew that if I went home with a catheter and, and I was still passing lots of blood, it could get blocked up. And then, you know, you're at home, the catheter's blocked with a clot. You, you're going to have to clear it yourself or go to emergency to get it cleared. So I said, I don't mind. I can stay in the hospital as long as needed. I don't mind to go back on irrigation. Let's, let's clear that up. So... The nurse came back in and she reconnected it all and I had another night of bladder irrigation, changing the bags. Now one thing you can do to help the nurses is they're busy. Um, when they set the flow rate for, for the irrigation, it can be fast, it can be slow, depending on what the colour of your urine is. It's hard for them to know when the drainage bag is going to get full. So it's four litres, but 
it could fill up in an hour or it could fill up in three hours depending on the flow rate so there was a couple of times where it went past the four liters and it was getting full so i pressed the 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 button to let the nurse know that i needed assistance and i and soon she come in she's all oh, the put the bags full okay let's let's change it the other thing that she needed to be mindful of was uh, i just go back to these photos here these these bags here they they should never be in a state where they're empty because if they're empty it means that you're not being flushed out and you're bleeding and you can start to form a clot so that's why they have one higher than the other so that they flow at different rates and if one's empty the other one's still going um, so they need to keep an eye on that that basically before they empty they need to change them out and, and keep the flow going to prevent to prevent those clots all right let's move on um, in my hand there was a needle where the anesthesia stuff went through the drugs the IV had been disconnected but it was still sitting there and it was quite a sharp needle and what I found was as I was sleeping and moving around it would brush on my sheets and it would pull back and it was getting really really sore and I mentioned it to the nurse and she said oh I can help you out with that and she put a glove on my hand so that's that's what I've got here is a glove over that needle port that was coming out of my my wrist at the back of my hand and that helped a lot so as I put my hand into my sheets it didn't pull back and and start hurting so I was quite happy with that all right so at some point the blood that's coming out of your bladder is clearing up and so this is on Saturday Saturday morning they stopped the bladder irrigation again and now they prepared me for the void trial which means that they're getting ready to send me home so you can see in this photo here all the tubes have been removed um, just before they removed my catheter the nurse came in with a big plunger and she said we're going to do a void trial and test you know if you can pass urine without the catheter and we'll see how much is left in your bladder after after you've passed gone to the toilet so she said i'll start you off i'll inject 200 mil in into your bladder with the catheter right now so she, she got to the port and injected 200 mil saline solution into my bladder and then she removed the catheter now i've had catheters <laughs> and every time they've removed one it's it's been painful because i've been quite red raw down there but it was surprisingly painless for a change and the catheter is not like a two-way catheter it's quite a big catheter and i was surprised that it was removed and and it was no big deal at all oh, that that actually reminds me about catheters uh, i should have brought this up before but if you've never experienced a catheter before and you've now got the catheter because of the surgery you could be a bit sensitive to the catheter and get um, bladder spasms so you're not used to having that catheter inside you and you squeeze down and start sp having spasms like you you want to push everything out just be aware that it's something that could happen and you try and relax and and wait for them to go away so getting back to uh, the catheter removal my catheter was removed and now I've got no catheter I've I'm, I'm basically ready to do a void trial and I've got 200 mil already inside my bladder so um, I stood up and thought well I'll try and hold it in as long as I can because yeah I was a bit apprehensive because this is the point where you've you know the results of your terp surgery it's going to be the first time you pee without a catheter without the restrictions that you've been suffering with all these years so um, I tried not to think about it I, I went to the patient next to me and I had a chat with him and uh, he had uh, a hernia and it was a hernia seems quite 
so many patients with a hernia and uh, but he also had a, a radical surgery for his prostate and he was and I asked him about that because you know I'm in for a turp and he said yes he had cancer and um, he wanted to make sure that they got all of it so in, instead of leaving the nerves he said take the whole prostate and the nerves and he said that um, as a result of that he he basically had erectile dysfunction and and there was a period of time where he actually mourned the loss of functionality so he said yeah it, it really affected him but he that's his decision to have everything removed and here i was standing there waiting for my my void trial where i'd get to see the results of my um terp so i was oh dear that's the sort of um, information I wanted to hear at this stage but um, it was I was just standing there and then he noticed that I was leaking and drops of blood were falling on the floor and uh, I quickly wiped them up and took the bedpan into the toilet and had my first urination and normally when I urinate I, I'd be lucky if I pass 50 mil and she had put 200 mil in my bladder just to get the thing, the process going. And uh, yeah, I, I did my first urination and straight off the bat, 200 mil came gushing out, gushing out. It, it was burning, it was a bit hurty, but 200 mil came gushing out. And I was just amazed, amazed. But I didn't want to get my hopes up. So um, I, I tried to do the double void. So you pass and then you see if you've got anything left in you and you have another go. But that was it. So I went back to the bed and I called the nurse. So there's, there's a video of me pacing around between uh, void trials. So the nurse eventually came and she uh, got the ultrasound and measured my bladder and there was 23 mil still left in my bladder which is a record for me I'd, I'd, I'd never been anywhere near that figures like every time I did a voile trial it was like the best I did was 200 mil and but most times it was about 400 mil left in my bladder but here a while here I was I just had great flow and the urine left in my bladder was at 23 so I was feeling good and then I did my second void trial I drank more water and I guess I rushed this one because when I went to the toilet hardly anything came out at all probably about 50 mil and two clots came out which is um, just up the top here and I thought oh well oh, that's disappointing and clots came out as well and I then tried to wait a bit and tried to go again and nothing was coming out. So I called the nurse and she brought the equipment in and we did another ultrasound. And this time there was 63 mil left inside me, which was not good. It's, it's, it's a fail. And I was thinking, oh, you shouldn't have got your hopes up too, um, too high so quickly. Um, right let's do the third one and so you keep on doing these void trials until you know are, are you passing enough urine are you backing up are you retaining urine in your bladder so you keep on these doing these trials until they work out how how, how it's going and if you keep on failing you'll go home with the catheter again so uh, i knew that that was coming up so i thought well okay the third trial I'll drink as much as I can I'll have lunch I'll drink the apple juice I'll drink the coffee diuretic that, that's all gonna and I'm gonna try and fill up my bladder and and void it when there's uh, more than 200 mil in it I'm not gonna go when it's as soon as I want to go I'm gonna hold it in a little bit I guess so again I walked around and I talked to my my neighbor and had a chat with him and uh, 
waited and waited. And uh, eventually I did notice I was leaking a bit because I was trying to hold it in. And uh, based on the flow I saw from the first trial, it's like, it's the, like if, if you relax, it, the gates are open and it comes flooding out. So um, yes, it was a little bit of leakage, but I held it in and I did my third trial and went in and 220 mil came out and into the bedpan and it felt good. It, it, of course, it's a bit hurty and a bit of a sting there, but I was happy and I called the nurse and I got the best news I'd heard in a long time. She said that there was zero mil left in my bladder. Uh, I, when I heard the word zero, I was elated. I completely emptied my bladder, which was something I hadn't known in years. So she said, let's, let's pass this on to the doctor. Did you want to keep going? Do you want to do another one? I said, no, let's, let's call the doctor and, uh, and see what he says. And uh, eventually I got to see the doctor and I also saw my su surgeon as well. And he, he went into more detail about my, my surgery. And I could just see from his eyes that he had done his best to, to, to give me the best outcome possible. So I just had so much appreciation for what everyone had done for me. I just couldn't express it in words. But, but as he was explaining things, I, I just wanted to listen to what he said. And he explained about how long the surgery had, had been. It had been something like an hour and a half. And, and he, because my prostate was so big that if he wouldn't have had time to do both sides, so I decided to do one side. Normally, he, they would withdraw about 20 mil of tissue when they widened the prostate. But in my case, the prostate was so large that he removed 30 mil just on one side. He mentioned that there was a flap and that that flap could get in the way when you're urinating and that we need to monitor this and 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 see if things are good for you and if that flap gets in the way and there's complications we may have to do a second turp, a follow-up turp and and maybe even try and do the other side but first let's let's see how it goes with what you've got so i was i was i was already experiencing great flow so i i thought well okay it's a possibility maybe i'll have complications and things will regress but um so far so good and i just felt so much appreciation for for what had been done for me the doctor gave gave me permission to go home and without a catheter if i had trouble like a, a blood clot formed and i blocked up i would have to go into emergency and get a catheter to, to sort that out but i was going home and uh, so I, I called my wife and she came to pick me up and yeah i went home and so began my first night so i went home i went to the toilet again and i filled a cup i think i passed 200 mil in a cup and that first pee was incredible. The, I, I did that in less than 10 seconds. So previously I'd be struggling to get 50, maybe 80 mil out and, and it would come out slowly and dribble out. But here I was filling up a, a cup in less than 10 seconds. It, it came out so fast, there were bubbles. And so, so I was just so happy. And um, so that was great news. and. I let my wife know if things are working, it's still a bit red, it still hurts a bit, but the pain levels are fine. You'll find that the, the pain levels are, if you do have issues, probably a Panadol would sort it out. I, told, I was told that to go home and not to exercise, not to lift up heavy things for four weeks, because what you don't want to do is, is to strain yourself and cause a, 
that prostrate to open up again and, and then it'll heal up and you'll probably get scar tissue and, and then the scar tissue is all lumpy and, and interfere with the flow. So yeah, um, take those instructions seriously. Just take it easy. And I was more than prepared to take it easy. And I, I can, you know, do my sports and, and recover my fitness later. Um, that night, I was amazed at how much urine I passed. So I'd, I'd fill up a cup and then the next, and then an hour later I'd fill up another cup and now it'd be 250 mil. Then an hour later I'd fill up another cup and now it's right to the, the top like 280 mil. Then I'd fill up another cup and then it would be overflowing. And I'm going, my goodness, I'm passing so much urine, what's going on? I think it's because during the void trials I had drunk so much water that it just had accumulated in my body and now my bladder was free to void on its own, my, everything was coming back and it was just flushing everything out of my system. So that night I must have got up about eight times filling up cups and emptying it and by morning eventually came down to about 150 mil. And I, I measured myself, and I had lost two over two kilograms by by morning. I had passed so much fluid, so I, I had passed over two liters in that one night. Incredible, and I was just ecstatic. So I still had this niggling doubt. Well, I'm flying fantastic and all, but do I have nerve damage? That was a bit of an uncertainty. You know, if you have nerve damage, which rarely happens, but it can happen. The next night I was sleeping and I had nocturnal erection, morning wood, and in the morning I said, hang on, that's, that's a uh, nocturnal erection. So everything's functioning. And uh, last night as well, um, even more so, sometimes it can be quite painful because you've had surgery and all, and that's the sort of last thing you, you want because it, it's sort of a bit painful. At the same time, you're happy that everything's functioning properly. Um, if you get sent home with a catheter, um, I've experienced this before I had all this surgery and I had permanent catheters, in that if you have an erection while you're asleep, it can be quite painful. And uh, it's, you sort of wish you, you didn't have them. Everything's going well so far. I was told to keep taking the antibiotics um, just in case you get an infection. I'll probably do one more day of the antibiotics because it's like a five day course. I'll then start on working on getting my digestion back to normal because the antibiotics do mess you up. Um, I found that on the day of my surgery I went in, um, I did go to the toilet that morning, but since then I hadn't been to the toilet at all. I guess it's the anesthesia, the um, antibiotics and that, it, it does mess with you and it's normal to not go. And in a way it's sort of good because after the surgery any straining to push out I think would make, mean that the bleeding would get more profuse. So last, um, finally this morning I thought, okay I'm going to have to get some laxatives to try and get things going again and just talking about it meant that this morning I went to the toilet and everything came out and so I was very happy about that. So I was taking those softeners during the time I was in hospital in anticipation of that happening, that things would block up and I, I would need those softeners to make sure that not, nothing got rock hard and constipated. So I'm glad I did that. So you can see that even at home, when I initially got back, things were red and I was passing blood clots. That, that's the photo there of some blood clots at the bottom. And as you can see, it, the color has changed and it's a nice golden color. And I'm drinking as much as I can because um, I, I, I don't want UTIs and I want to keep on flushing and clearing that blood. If, if I don't drink a lot, and I just pass out a little bit, I can see that there's still blood in my urine. And I think that continu can continue for a couple of weeks. So everyone's different, of course. But I'm so happy that I didn't have to go home with a catheter. So, uh, yeah, um, 
This has been my personal experience so far. I'm not a doctor, I'm just a lay person. I'm putting this information up so that other guys can see how other men do with this procedure. I found a couple of things interesting about TERP in that it's quite an old procedure. So it first started in 1926. So it's been around for quite, a, quite some time. It's considered the gold standard. There are other, other surgery surgeries you can have like Neurolift 2 where there's no issues with retrograde ejaculation because they just put shoot out threads and they, they go through your prostate and they tuck it in. So it's quite a non-invasive bit of surgery. Um, I don't think I was eligible for that because my prostate was so big. But uh, my experience with TERP, it's, it's incredible. And having discussed it with my wife, she made the typical remark of, why did we have to go through all this worry and you know worry about going on holidays and you going into retention and being in so much pain and why did we go through all that? You should have had the surgery earlier. I suppose she's right. I, I shouldn't have prolonged it so long. One of the issues with prolonging surgery is that if you're holding on and you're retaining urine for so long, you can actually damage your bladder and your kidneys. So something that you need to discuss with your urologist to, to find out what, what's best for you. So um, I'm on day six. I'm very happy with the results so far. Um, it's not to say that I could, I may not have complications down the track, but I think from the way my body's feeling and the way I'm urinating, that uh, I'm I'm good. Now, people say that, well, from the research I did, that the prostate can grow back, so like three to five years. It's quite a low percentage of men that have that. I've changed my diet, so five years ago. I was getting, I suppose my diet that I had always eaten was fine. I had never put on weight and I was healthy. And But when once I got to 55, I started putting on weight. I felt like uh, becoming resistant to insulin because I went from 75 kilos up to 101 kilos. And my feet were getting puffy and, you know, I had to have sleeps and have uh, weird things and... I wasn't healthy and something snapped and I decided well, I've got to get on top of this. So I started a, a, a campaign to fix my health, but that worked. So my allergies went away. I dropped from 101 kilos down to 80. I did that by cutting out carbs, sweets, eating good oils, just eating naturally as possible. No junk food. I still eat sweets occasionally, but and cutting out the carbs and bread and things were a big ticket item. So my health improved no end. My allergies went. I lost all the weight. All these aches and pains that I had went as well. But it didn't fix my prostate. It, it, it was already enlarged. And um, no making that go away. I did try. I tried all sorts of things. So I, that's my experience. Uh, hopefully some of the apprehensions that you may have about the TERP procedure have been addressed by my experience and on the video that I took in the photos you can see that that a lot of things are going on but when you know what's going on it's it's no big deal and the pain which I thought I'd have given all of my experiences with infections and catheters I thought the pain is going to be worse but it wasn't it was actually less than what I had a lot less than what I expected. In fact, it's quite mild. And I'm sitting here with virtually, I've got a bit of a tinge and I can feel my tummy because I've had surgery, but it's nothing really to worry about. If it got uncomfortable, I could always have a Panadol and, and that should suffice. So it was a lot of information. Hopefully it was of some benefit to you. If there was a go away message that I could convey, that would be talk to your specialist, talk about all your options, um, ask as many questions as you can. These guys have, have you know, spent years of, of their life specializing in this area just to help you take take their advice. If you have reservations about the TERP, I, I, in my case, 
they've cleared up now I would definitely get it all right catch you in another video maybe I'll talk about um, health issues and, and diet that was my video on turp I hope you liked it bye